by philology as a principle, uh, he, Rosenzweig says the Greeks were not at that time a civilization at all. They were just an ethnos or a tribe. Uh, and then he describes the beginnings of the Common Era, the, of the, the peoples of the earth before the Common Era. Their very first encounters, springing from war or from trade, establish certain spiritual contacts among people, but they do not create between them a world historical bond. For this, more than a haphazard flow of influences is required. The creation of such a bond demands the conscious transfer into one's own sphere of something recognized as alien. In other words, it requires translation. The historical moment of the birth of world literature, and hence of trans-ethnic consciousness, we might say civilization, occurred in the full light of history with two events, when two books, each the very foundation of its ethnos, of the literature of its ethnos, was first translated into another language. Uh, and this is what I've already mentioned, the Odyssey and the Old Testament. And this is uh, uh, Franz Rosenzweig writing in about 1925. We could also add that in the first century of the Common Era, Longinus in On the Sublime, Perihipsus, cites for the very first time in the Greek text words translated from the Hebrew <coughs> scriptures. Words which he ascribes to the lawgiver of the Jews, uh, he ascribes the lawgiver of the Jews, Moses, whom he describes as no ordinary man, according at least to these words, which he cites as exemplary of the sublime from outside of the Greek tradition. And God said, let there be life. <coughs> Rosenzweig's claim for the centrality of translation in the very project of civilization, of the emergence of human society out of tribalism, suggests two thoughts. One, that in the larger scheme of things, translators deserve not just more credit, they deserve as much credit, at least, as authors. I hope that's a position that would be approved of by all you translators. <laughs> Two, that translation is not always undertaken primarily for the benefit of those who cannot read the original. This is something we tend to forget. The translator's aim is often especially in the early years of an emerging vernacular or the early years of an encounter, to test the ability of the younger language to receive the thoughts carried over from the old one. That's the young and old in, in that sense, just relative to the encounter. Around about 1600, there were very few people in the English-speaking world who could read without being able to read Latin. Latin was actually the language with which, in which you learnt to read. So any translation from Latin into English was much more for the admiration of the learned rather than for the benefit of the unlearned. Uh, just as today in Denmark, everybody reads English, why does anyone think it necessary to translate Seamus Heaney into Danish? Right? It's done to see how it would look, not done for any Dane who can't read English, because any Dane who can't read English would not be interested in reading Seamus Heaney. Uh, that's not how it works. Uh, and we've got to remember that, that, that with literary translation, certainly, but I think a lot of translations, it's the challenge to the, to, to, to the, to the target language uh, that, 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 that is the interest, and it's a matter of judging it by people who know both languages. Reading aloud is, of course, a very different matter from reading. And that is why biblical translation has to be uh, central to all theories of translation, uh, because it is, of course, the most translated in the text. And it is the only text that is appointed and authorized to be read aloud to congregations who are likewise authorized and obliged to pay attention. Both these points could be exemplified, as it were, negatively by the story of the introduction of new words into English as displayed by the Oxford English Dictionary. We have frequently shown that a word was first used by Shakespeare who is credited with having introduced more new words into English than any other writer, and so on and so on. However, the Oxford English Dictionary, until very recently, paid scant attention to translations, and therefore suppressed what ought to be obvious, that it is not authors but translators who do the main work of carrying words across from other languages into English. 
Most of the Latin and Greek words that came into English in the 16th and 17th centuries are English. That is, they are turned into English in the process of, of translation, but not turned into English, but given an English form. The test is to see whether the newly English word could be adopted and assimilated. Thousands were not, and may be known to us probably through Love's Labour's Lost, a sort of satire on learned Englishisms. Of the verb to English, the Oxford English Dictionary cites as the earliest instance that great translator of the Bible, Wycliffe, in 1397. Two, two quotations, I English it thus, and then to English it after the word would be dark and dutiful, dark and doubtful. Which quotation reminds us that, in other words, not to follow word for word, but to explain things in a context that the reader will understand, what is termed today dynamic or functional equivalence, is not a modern theory. Though it is associated in, the, in, in modern times with one whose task was similar to Wycliffe, uh, another figure, in, in, a founding figure in the field of translation studies, Eugene Nieder. Nieder, who lived from 1914 to 2011, was, after all, a linguist before he became an evangelical, and his experience of translating the Bible into some 200 languages carries its own authority. The Bible is the exemplary text, the test, test case for any theory of translation. It has, after all, been read almost exclusively in translation, and read aloud in remotest and most extreme contexts. For reasons that no cat classicist could either accept or explain, it has never been a requirement of Christians that they should be able to read the Bible in the original tongue, whether Koine Greek or Hebrew. The difference in this respect uh, between Christians on the one side and on the other, Jews and Muslims, is, is, is astonishing for the people of the book, as it were. Three peoples of the book, uh, but one of them, one lot, are allowed to get away with translations, the others are not. And is there any other book in the world, and I'm not talking only about sacred books, is there any other book in the world on whose readers so little pressure is enjoined to read it in the original? I mean, I cannot read a book by Mo Yan and go up to a Chinese colleague and say, I can read Mo Yan. If you haven't read it in the original, uh, it was a Saki or I've read or Han Pamuk. I say to a Turkish colleague, but you haven't read it in the original. And I'm beginning to say, no, because it's a great deal better in English, I can assure you. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but that sort of put down that you get when you try to show enthusiasm and interest in somebody's literature, somebody's culture, you always get a put down for reading it in translation, uh, but never in the case of the Bible, and I find this quite remarkable. Um, I've been reading the Bible, oh, in the original. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Given the contrast between its global reach and its particular local setting, the Bible poses extreme challenges to the translator. How does one tell stories about camels to those who live in other climates? Nida, like Wycliffe, translates, recommends translating not by the word dark and dutiful, but by the words that serve an analogous sense semantic function. There's no point introducing the word camel for the into the Inuit, into a language of the Inuit people, much better to talk about caribou. The point, of course, for Nida as for Wycliffe, is that the Bible has, the prime reason to translate the Bible is that it should be understood, but of course understood within the light of a Christian hermeneutic. We might suppose that to be the aim of any translation, to be understood. <coughs> Could there be a theory of translation which is aimed against ready comprehension? Oddly enough, there is. And it was put forward by Rosenzweig, who saw one function of translation to be the modification of the target language by the pressure of the linguistic and syntactical and, and lexical pressures of the source language. This view was also shared by Walter Benjamin in his great essay, The Task of the Translator, from 1923. Benjamin and Rosenzweig were friends. Englishing is thus the most alienating device for a translator, that is to say, rather than make a cult, you take a word like geography, instead of calling it earth knowledge or earth wit, would be the, uh, the, 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 the calc of geography, is it earth wit? Uh, you just keep it in the Greek as geography. And it is therefore the most alienating device 
for a translator, as it extends the English vocabulary from its own stock to take in all those funny words, those funny foreign words, whose morphology can remain problematic for centuries. Some months ago, you may remember September, I noted that a number of politicians, even some of the BBC's own very fluent interviewers, would hesitate and stumble over how to make a plural of the word referendum. Even lexically, I suppose one is enough. <laughs> T.S. Eliot said that every poem changes the tradition. We might, by analogy, add that every translation changes the language. A translation is every bit as much as a, li a literary text as is a so-called original composition. It may indeed contribute to the language more than does the original composition by forcing new words, new syntagms, new phrases, distorting word order a little bit, and so on and so on, demanding new ways of thinking. Over the years, new and foreign ways become our ways to be protected against the next onslaught from without. I just think of English as I knew it 40 years, 40 years ago, who had heard of words of Arabic or Turkish origin which let us stick only to innocent subjects like food, falafel or kebab. Yet who now remembers, as I do, when pizza and cappuccino were alien words in English? It was not until about 1970 that they shed their italics, though not their Italianness. Espresso and even yogurt, just a few years earlier, 1950s. Impurity is the very being of translation, but it is also the very life of language. A fundamental error in thinking about translation was identified as early as 1879 by Butcher and Lang in, their, in the preface to their prose translation of the Odyssey, which was a radical move at the time to do it in prose. There would have been less controversy about the proper method of Homeric translation, they write, if critics had recognized that the question is a purely relative one, that of Homer there can be no final translation. The taste and the literary habits of each age demand different qualities in poetry and therefore a different sort of rendering of Homer. To the men of the time of Elizabeth, Homer would have appeared bald, it seems, and lacking in ingenuity if he had been presented in his antique simplicity. For the Elizabethan age, Chapman supplied what was then necessary and the mannerisms that were then deemed of the essence of poetry, namely daring and luxurious conceits, thus in Chapman's verse, Troy must shed her towers for tears of overthrow, and when the winds toss Odysseus about, their sport must be called the when the winds toss Odysseus about, their sport must be called the horrid tennis. The horrid tennis. <laughs> Here we touch what must be the heart of the problem. Translation is not interpretation for two reasons. First, because it is written, not spoken. Second, and in consequence, the translation endures as does the original work. Yet the reason for what Butcher and Lang rightly deplores is what distinguishes an original author from a translator. The original author, the compositional author, I'd rather call him, must get it right, as there will be, short of a reprint or a re new edition, no second chance. Getting it right matters absolutely to the poet for whom we're told poets the best word, the best, best words in the best order and all that sort of thing. Whereas for the translator, there is, by contrast, no possibility of getting it right at all. Every translation is flawed from the start, inadequate simply by virtue of not being the same. There is no such thing as a definitive translation since there are constant advances in biblical scholarship as well as changes in all living languages, said Nida. And he went on to say, no major translation should last more than 50 years. This is what is most vital and vitalizing about a translation. Poetry is, as we, as, as, as we know, uh, words that do not alter. Rather like love in Shakespeare's sonnet. Love is not love, which alters when it alteration finds, but translation is all about altering when it alteration finds and bending and so on. It is an ever fixed mark, is love. Translation knows no ever fixed mark. <coughs> Uh, it is, in this sense, the very antithesis of poetry. It begins with a radical alteration from one tongue to another, and there is no limit to the ways in which that translation can be made. 
we could produce as many. We are bound to produce as many translations as there are people. Even one line of Shakespeare, if we were to translate in this form, the chances of any two of us producing identical translations will be infinitesimal. Small. I mean, it's just, so forget getting it right. Uh, but remember George Steiner's description of the work of a mid-20th century editor of Shakespeare, who makes as many alterations to the text as is deemed necessary to match the needs and resources of the modern reader. Is there a single unalterable textual sign for an editor? Is there one ever fixed mark? Think of the name of Shakespeare. It became fixed in the 18th century, uh, but I can imagine some original spelling freak suggesting we go back to Shakespeare, and that could take over and so on. Nothing is fixed in, in literature. Translations modernize and they tend to disambiguate. I can give numerous examples of this. One would be, um, they modernize, they disambiguate, and they abbreviate. So Walter Scott remains an extremely popular novelist in any language except English, for the simple reason that French, German, and Russian translations of Scott, as far as I can see, uh, cut about 100 pages off each of his 500-page novels. <laughs> a, a very good idea. Um, uh, they also uh, disambiguate, uh, partly because of the pragmatic tendency of translators. Uh, I mean, translators often come up to me, and Danes and so forth, and come and say, what does this mean? What does this mean? And I say, well, that's an interesting crux. You know, we leave it there, I mean, there's a crux. But a translator cannot tolerate a crux. A translator feels an obligation to, as it were, explain. Uh, um, and this, this goes, I mean, this is obviously, if you're, I mean, insofar as translation moves from, say, what we've been hearing about, medical or legal translation into literary translation, well, if you've been doing the medical and legal stuff, you know you've got to get it right or you'll, or you'll be liable for insurance claims and so on and so on. Um, whereas if you're doing literary translation, of course, it doesn't matter. 